Hello, my name is Walt, if you don't know me, welcome to my channel. I talk about comics and very rarely about books. This is one of those rare videos. It's uh, the first time that I join a tag. It's the Nonfiction November tag. And I have a ton of books here, which I have planned to at least sample in the month of November. And yeah, I wanted to present them to you. So this is a very um, thick stack of books. Of course, I won't be able to finish all of them, but maybe half of them. That would be already pretty great. And um, yeah, I, I gathered them. I gather books like I gather comics. <laughs> I want to, uh, whenever I discover something interesting, I buy it and I put it on my to read pile and there it stays for a long time. And sometimes I sample them. I get into them and when I get the basic idea, I, I'm not very motivated to finish them. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I have come to um, accept this fact that I don't have to finish every book and uh, also that I buy more than I can read. I think it's okay. I help the market, <laughs> I help the writers. So, uh, yeah, the only person who's not very happy about it is my fiance, but well, everyone has um, his flaws and failures, so um, this is mine. And I will tell you a little bit about the books and, um, well, of course, as much as I know, uh, because I haven't read them yet, um, except for this one here. This one I have half of it finished. Um, I have lost a um, proper cover, uh, but it's by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, it's called Skin in the Game and Taleb is not highly controversial but he's a very, as a public figure, he, um, he uses very strong language when he's getting into an argument with someone and he accuses people of being idiots and stupid and stuff like that. So yeah, one can like this or not, but he's a very clever um, person. He used to work as a risk manager um, at hedge fund companies, so he comes from mathematics, this is his background, and he tries to look at um, culture and, and at our assumptions about the world through a mathem mathematic lens, um, and it's very interesting. I've read uh, two of his books, his previous books, one was The Black Swan, about the prob probability of very Im improbable events um, that do happen, but we can't we can plan for them because we, we're not aware that they can exist. Um, and the other one was um, um, anti-fragility, which is about the concept of, um, well, um, not building systems or lives on um, the assumption that everything will stay stable, but um, building it on the assumption that it has not only to be resilient to, to be anti-something, anti-change, but that it profits from um, the fact that it's um, getting attacked or changed all the time. So anti-fragility, um, it was built, of course, on the assumption of the possibility of black swans. And this year, uh, Skin in the Game is another, um, well, um, basically, exploration of, on the fact that all those uh, theories and a lot of decision-making that takes part based on those theories that everything will change for the better and everything will be um, is going to be calculated and it will work out uh, that those assumptions are made by people who have no skin in the game um, a lot of politicians a lot of very important decisions makers in um, economy and, and, and sorts and um, the whole of academia <laughs> profits from a system that looks very reliable. Uh, but of course, um, if it fails, like with the banks, it's not the bankers who have to pay the price, but it's the normal people, uh, the small people. And yeah, so it's, you could say he's kind of an 
an intellectual um, he, he doesn't like doesn't like the term intellectual anymore uh, but he is of course one um, an intellectual who uh, stays with a little man uh, in this case I would say he has some populist undertones so if you um, completely um, disagree with everything that populists stand for um, you will have trouble reading this if you want to explore um, maybe more um, intellectual side of it and um, this is very interesting all right I don't know much about this one here um, I got this as a present it's only in German so um, it probably I can probably just skip it it's called Desentik wird euch um, so uh, there's a big there's big talk about integration in Germany because a lot of foreigners came in with a migration crisis and um, so integration and what integrated to what uh, identity this is those are all topics which are very virulent in today's uh, german politics and uh, this guy here says uh, don't do it don't integrate yourself that's all i know about it i thought that um it's um about like keeping your foreigner identity so i wasn't very interested in it uh, but a friend of mine who gave it to me for my birthday said no it's um it's about um the fact that people who are saying integration um, don't mean the same thing as uh, building up an, a nation state, a new source of nation state, but uh, they just use it as, a, as an empty word. Whatever it is, I will find out. I will definitely sample it because it's a present. Next up we have um, who we are and how we got here and by David Reich. Um, he's um, a gen genetic expert um, and it's about ancient data or ancient DNA and the new science of the human past so now they can decode a lot of um, um, ancestral um, DNA I've tried to read a book which was very similar but I didn't understand anything so I hope this one is a bit easier for uh, for the um, for the layman and um, I find the idea of super interesting. I was always very interested in prehistoric times. So whatever happened before we settled down and started build civilizations, were those already like tribal structures? Did they have like um, the hunters and gatherers? Were they like how were they organized? Where do they, how do they how did they move? How did all the languages come uh, into the world? And, and this is for me hyper interesting and there's not much material on it. So this is basically the retelling of the um, Völkerwanderung in English, um, the migration, the early migration of peoples uh, throughout uh, the Euro-Asian continent uh, looked through the lens of genetics. So now we don't have to speculate anymore. We can probably say, well, this is where the Turks come from and this is how they mingled with those and stuff like that. And for me, it's, it's great and it has maps in it and I love maps, so this will be great. Next up is a border. Um, this one's in English. It's by Kapka Kasabova and it's called A Journey to the Edge of Europe. Um, I'm always interested in the Balkans because I'm born in Romania and I think a lot of things that happen in the Balkans will spread towards Europe uh, later on. At least this is what happened for a very long time. So it's, it's a weird um, situation because the, um, the Balkans are in a way, um, um, how, how can I put it? Um, of course, behind what um, uh, cultural development and political development um, 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 is experienced in the West, uh, the, the East has to catch up always. But in, in another, um, when you look at, at it from another angle, um, when they catch up, it, it goes so fast that it's always exploding. So um, nationalism was a part of the West. It started in the, in the basically with the enlightenment. Um, it was a concept of the left to build nation states. Um, and um, when it arrived in the East, it was already a very chauvinistic thing and um, it, yeah, it created a lot of tension. We all know about the First World War and uh, uh, yeah, 
all the things that still happened into the 90s, the, the last big war in Europe was um, in the Balkans. Many people forget about the uh, war in Yugoslavia. And uh, she, I think she's from Yugoslavia, or she's, she was born, uh, no, not quite. And it's also not about Yugoslavia, it's about another part of the Balkans. She goes to the fragile border be uh, between Bulgaria, Turkey and Greece. Um, and I think this is a very interesting spot um, because, of course, Greece um, and Turkey are, um, have a lot of tensions and uh, Bulgaria is, um, used to be a very important part of, of Balkan history, is now just a country who loses a lot of, um, um, a lot of people due to migration. Um, uh, but yeah, <laughs> I'm getting into too many details here. So she's just visiting those people and she tries to find out um, what um, their thoughts are and what, how, how history is still um, playing a very important role in, the, in those areas where the culture divides are and all those kind of stuff. And, and it's more um, a personal essayistic way of uh, approaching those things and I, I, I love those. All right, next up is Francis Fukuyama, uh, identity. So you see there's a big theme here uh, around, um, I'm very interested in identity and, 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 um, and political um, uh, things nowadays. I, I, I was apolitical for a very long time, but now it came back into the world and I have to catch up with it. So um, yes, Francis Fukuyama, many people know as um, the professor or the, the person in the West who declared the end of history. This was his claim that um, after the collapse of the, of the Eastern Bloc and of the um, um, Russian Empire, um, the whole world now will, um, will be embracing liberalism and this is the end of history. It's like, it's like the communist version that when every country in the world will be communist, then we have achieved everything and this is the end of it. <laughs> not, nothing will change anymore. And, and the West had, had a similar um, um, image of the world, but just like um, with, different, uh, with a different spin on it. Um, and yeah, it turned out that it didn't happen that way. That uh, when um, communism failed, uh, liberalism was on its toes uh, with climate change with uh, wealth disparities. We see that liberalism also has a lot of, of problems in itself and that other systems, we don't know exactly how they will look like, um, partly come back. There is a chauvinist uh, right-wing version of, um, of, the, of the past that it tries to come back. There is a new kind of right which uh, tries to be a, a more a, more enlightenment uh, version of uh, to bring back a, an, an enlightenment non chauvinist version of nationalism back. Uh, there is a populist left wing movement um, who um, go back to well trying to to bring back socialist ideas into play. So there are many many ideas on the market right now, and um, all of them um, have to deal with the problem of identity. So. Um, which is the group that, <laughs> that defines um, where these ideas are operated onto. So is it, are we talking about regions, are we talking about nations, about um, continents or, or um, multi-state um, um, things like the European Union. And um, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a very, very um, difficult uh, period in, in in history, in modern history, of course, early history was much worse. Uh, but yes, some things are changing and a lot of people are afraid of it. And I, I'm not as much afraid of it. I think it's a normal process. And um, yes, so Fukuyama is talking about contemporary identity politics and the struggle for recognition. Um, and uh, he's a very, he's a strong proponent of uh, civic nationalism and I think this will be also like um, um, written against an ethnic uh, version of nationalism that is also creeping up right now. Uh, but yeah, we'll see.
Next up is um, a book by Pangaj Mishra, who is an uh, Indian intellectual. I'm pretty sure he's Indian. He's not Pakistani, is he? Oops, I don't know for sure. And it's called uh, Zeitalter des Zorns, um, Age of Anger, I think it's in English. And um, I've already started it. As you can see, this guy is extremely well read uh, into the... Um, he knows about the, uh, all of the ideas of, of, um, that Europe and, and the West have, um, have developed over the last few hundred years. <laughs> he, he's read all of them and he looks, he has an outsider perspective, of course being of Indian heritage, uh, which is heavily influenced by, by, by uh, the British, uh, by British colonialism. So he's in a way an insider too, because um, um, the, the English history has all, somehow also became his, but he has also some resentment because of the colonial times. Um, so he's not completely neutral or he won't be probably completely objective, but he's a very, very intelligent outsider who, who looks at um, the development of, of ideas um, used Western Enlightenment um, ideas, liberalism, individualism, and where they led to. And um, he says that they all led up to this uh, age of anger um, where um, yeah, basically um, the West can't accept its own decline and becomes very angry. I think this is a very uh, stupid sum, sum up of uh, his, his thoughts. Uh, especially embarrassing because he's so intelligent and my English is just not good enough to to really get into the um, uh, details of it so maybe I should do those videos in German in the future where, where it, when it's about politics and stuff um, next up is the Eva F hat euch lieb um, it's by Bettina Röhl it's another German book uh, by the daughter of a German t uh, terrorist. There was a German uh, terror group called RAF, uh, Rote Armee Fraktion, Red Army Fraction, in the, um, and I'm not even sure when they started, early 70s, early to mid 70s. Um, so yeah, you can see, um, I'm not super versed in it, uh, though I have watched so many documentaries, but this is the problem, I forget everything, so it's cool. I can read books uh, uh, about the same topics again and again, and it's always interesting. Um, yeah, it's interesting because she is the daughter of a terrorist. She can tell the story of how a terrorist movement is born uh, through this familiar lens. And I find this very intriguing. And the last one is The Storm Bef Before the Storm. The Beginning of the End of the Roman Republic <laughs> by Mike Duncan. Mike Duncan has a pretty cool podcast about uh, Roman history. Uh, it's called, I don't know exactly, I have forgotten the name. Uh, I've listened to a few episodes and uh, I really like it. Um, but I'm also very attracted to Roman history um, uh, since, I don't know, a year or so. Um, because, of course, you always look into the past and try to find answers for the present. And I don't think it's just, um, you know, um, it's by chance that he picked this phase of Roman history to tell us more about um, the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic. So it's not the end of the Roman Empire, it's the, the end of the Roman Republic when the um, populare, the first populists come up, um, democracy gets a more, um, they want more direct democracy, they want more um, rights for the plebs uh, than there is uh, there are a lot of um, a lot of money goes into politics um, and yeah of course there are similarities to what is happening with the democracies of of today and uh, yeah I can't wait to get into it I, I think this is uh, one I'm most interested uh, right now in reading so you see uh, a lot of politics a lot of serious stuff um, but um, the cool thing about books nowadays, you know, when you when you would, would go back like 30, 40, 50, 50 years and would read um, books about politics, they were written for academics. Uh, but those here, all of them basically, are written for people who don't have to be experts, especially the, the um, 
Anglo-American tradition of uh, you know appealing to your readers has uh, brought a, a lot of readability to um, you know things that maybe if you if you learn them in school you know uh, Roman history can seem boring but um, they're actually very entertaining too and very um, yeah very intriguing in their in their process because yeah maybe we didn't have we didn't change that much uh, since those days where we uh, were hunters and gatherers. I don't know. We'll see. I will tell you more about my uh, insights when uh, November is up. Uh, thank you very much for watching. If you liked what you've seen, please subscribe. Uh, and like always, of course, uh, comment on the things that I said and enlighten me more. Um, I can do it. Thank you very much. Bye bye.